Good morning, Center Point. If you uh, have a Bible today, you can get, get that open to Galatians chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 11 to 24 today. Uh, for those of you new here, my name is Howie. I'm one of the pastors here at Center Point Church. And uh, three weeks ago, we started a series called Freedom. So Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 to 24. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about this. It only takes a moment to turn a life around. This is where we're going to see Paul going as he shares his story. So if you have your Bibles, Galatians chapter 1, 11 to 24. If you don't have a Bible, I have the verses on the screen. Uh, we just encourage you to take your Bible, to look at your Bible. The thing about me is I'm imperfect. So sometimes as I read and as I preach, I mispronounce things, I missay things, and that's a fallen messenger. But God's word, that's infallible. This is true. So God declares today through the Apostle Paul in verse 11 this. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently, and I tried to destroy it. And as I was advancing in Judaism, beyond many of my own age, among my people, so extremely zealous, that's passionate, was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Sicilia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they, were, and they glorified God because of me. When Jesus encounters a life and changes it by his grace, he introduces us, church, to real freedom. He shows us what it is like now to live life without the weight of sin, without the heaviness of sin upon us. Last week, if you were here, we talked about we have a danger to fall into one of two lanes. The first lane is that I work and I do good and that earns my salvation. That gives me favor before Jesus. And we said, that's a lie. That's not the gospel. So you're doing good. You're working hard. You're giving money. you you giving of your time, etc., to help people does not earn you favor with God. And if you know Jesus, that does not earn you the love of God. He already loves you. That's the first lane. Second lane, Jesus is amazing. That he would die on a cross for my sin. That he would rise from the grave for me. That's amazing. I like that. I want that. And then we acknowledge it, but then we live for ourselves. That's a false gospel as well. And these people go, Grace Howie, Grace, God's a God of love. God's a God of forgiveness. And I go, you're absolutely biblically right on. But if you've encountered grace, you don't use it as a license to live for yourself. That's where you become a legalist. Over here, you become a legalist because it's your rules you're doing, look at me, look at my behavior. Instead, here's what we're doing. We're calling people to the center. And we're saying, 
if you've been changed by Jesus, it's by his grace. And if his grace has changed you, you now live from that position of grace. Meaning this, if I'm over here, I'm doing not to earn his love, earn his favor, his salvation. I'm doing because I'm so blown away that he would save me by his grace that that's my natural response. I just love to serve Jesus because I already know who I am because of Jesus. If I'm over here, I go, no, grace doesn't permit me to do whatever I want. Grace came at an amazing price, an amazing cost. Jesus gave his life. So that does not permit me to sin and go, oh, well, he forgives. No, church. He, you need to see this. That does not permit you to do that. If you've been changed by Jesus and you live in sin, that should break your heart over and over and over. So Jesus is calling you like 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and restore you to righteousness. When a follower of Jesus messes up, there's a lot of grace, but it compels you to go, Jesus, oh, how I need you. We're calling you to the center that your identity is found in Jesus. And center point, if you are saved by Jesus, you're part of his mission. Here's why. When Jesus came, he declared that part of his mission is to what? Set the captives free. Here's what I see in the church so much. I see people proclaiming Jesus, acknowledging Jesus, but dragging around a chain. Meaning this. They're not free. They live in guilt. They live in shame. They don't know who they are. Their identity is all messed up because of the world and what the world is declaring. Instead, we need to get a refresher. Who does Jesus say I am? Who's my, really, what's my identity like in Jesus? That's where the church needs to go. And get this, when you see this, it blows you away. God loves me because of what Christ has done. And I just go, wow. None of my doing, none of my effort, it's all about what Jesus has done. So, so far in Galatians 1, here's what we see. We see Paul defending his character because false teachers are trying to tell the Galatians Paul's message it's not the real gospel. You need Jesus plus the Mosaic law. So Paul is defending his character. He even says in verse 10 where we left off last week, who do I live for? Do I live to please people or do I live to please God? And Paul's saying this, if I really was a people pleaser, my message would be totally different. See, the gospel if you haven't noticed, many times isn't very pleasing to the hearers. In our society especially. Because our society, here's what it's preaching. You're the champion. You're the winner. Do whatever you want and you'll succeed. That's a lie. It's a lie. You are not the champion. You are not the winner. Jesus is the champion. Jesus is the winner. So the gospel flies in the face of what society is preaching to us. Society is saying, believe in yourself. And if you believe in yourself, that's good. Good things are going to happen to you. Here's what we're saying. No, don't believe in yourself. Believe in Jesus who gives you confidence in yourself because you know who you are. And here's the thing. Life isn't going to be all about winning. As you follow Jesus, there will be curveball after curveball that knocks you down. Here's the good news with Jesus. You don't have to give up. You don't have to mourn like the world mourns because you know that in Jesus, there's hope and purpose. And Jesus is using all this good and all this bad for my good. That's the gospel. It's amazing, church. So Paul is defending the message he's preaching. Now you go, how does Paul defend that? Here's what I love. He defends it by what? Going to his own personal story. Here's the thing. Sometimes we're debaters 
we like a good argument. And what happens a lot in our evangelism is we come with the facts and we declare the facts and sometimes we declare the facts so aggressively that it's very unloving. I will tell you this. I followed Jesus now by his grace for 31 years. I have not led one person to Jesus by arguing. 31 years, not one person has come to know Jesus by arguing. But I have seen Jesus in his grace use me to love people and introduce the gospel into their circumstances with love, and I have seen the Spirit of God change hearts. Here's what I love about Paul. They're discrediting him, but notice where he goes. Where does he go? He goes to his story. He goes to what the church, and if you're not familiar with Christianese, it's what the church calls a personal testimony. But it's his story. And here's what Paul does. He explains where he was, who he was, and what Jesus did to change that. All of you in this room, you have a story. Some of your stories are amazing because Jesus has shown up and changed your story forever. So here's what I love. You have a story. So many people go, oh, Howie, I need, I need to know about evangelism. I need to know what to do. And I'm just saying, share what Jesus Christ has done. Share. This is who I was. And for some of you, who you were, others know that person, and they know who you are today. And here's what they will not say. Oh, that's not true. They can't argue about your story. Someone can't argue, you were really lost in sin, but now I notice there's a change in you. Nobody can argue that. They might argue, is Jesus God? They might argue about the Trinity. They might argue about Jesus being the only way, but how about this? Let me just tell you. I was here, but now I'm here. How's that possible? How's that possible? So Paul declares his story. In fact, Paul's story becomes his best argument. I love this. Your story, church, is your best argument for the proof of Jesus if he's changed you. Because trust me, outside of Jesus, we really know who we are. We're a mess, myself included. So I declare, look at what Jesus has done to Howie. You declare, look what Jesus has done to me. And you declare that with people. You share that with people all the time. So Paul is not sharing his story to point to himself. Some people go, oh, Howie, I want to be humble. Can't really share about myself, you know, spotlights on me. No, no, no. If you have the right heart, you share your story, but your story will not have you as the star. So as you share your story, you don't use words like this. You know what? I, I was doing this, but man, I, I worked up the strength, and I stopped that, and look at me, and now I go to church every week. I set my alarm at 5 a.m. every morning, and I have the discipline, and I get out of bed. Look at me, and I read scripture every single day, and I don't miss a day. That's not a testimony about how great Jesus is. That's you and your effort and your work. That's not the gospel. So the story that Paul is sharing isn't really about his glory. It's for the glory of Jesus. He tells his own story not only to vindicate himself, to defend himself, but more importantly, to defend his gospel. They're saying what Paul is preaching, that's not the real gospel. And Paul is saying, "Oh yeah, just hear me out. This is who I was. This is where I was, and then this gospel changed me. And in fact, Jesus commissioned me to preach this gospel. And here's what Paul says again in verse 11. For I would 
Therefore, I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. Let's just get this out. Man's gospel is this. Some of you sit in this room today and you go, if only I had more money, my life would be happy. My life would be better. So your gospel is, if I had more money, I would be happy. So let's reverse now. If that's your gospel, here we are today and you're going, how do I get more money? And you try to line up your life. Maybe it's, I get a better job. I get a savings account. I budget. And you have all these things in play to try to earn what you think will make you happy. Maybe it's, I'm going to marry someone rich. That's my quick fix. So I will get to my gospel. That's man's gospel. Man's gospel is, I believe I need this in my life to fulfill me, to make me happy. But the gospel of scripture is, Jesus has already done everything you need to find true happiness and true fulfillment. Now, some of you believe that, but you reverse back and you go, all right, now I need to read my Bible every day. Now I need to go to church every Sunday. Now I need to pray more, etc., etc., to try to earn what? God's favor. But the real gospel says this. You definitely need Jesus. You can't do anything about it except acknowledge that by God's grace. That's the gospel. Jesus has done everything I need to find the gospel. So man's gospel is what Paul is being accused of preaching, but Paul is saying, guys, if I was preaching man's gospel, my life story would be totally different. Verse 12, For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Here's what Paul is saying. I was on my way to kill Christians, and then Jesus showed up. This is in Acts. It's his personal story. He was on his way to Damascus to deliver papers to kill Christians, and all of a sudden, Jesus knocked him off his horse. And he said these words, Saul, why do you persecute, not the Christians, but Paul, why do you persecute me? And that encounter with Jesus changed Paul forever. Because in that encounter, Jesus now commissions who Saul changes his name to Paul. And you are going to go preach to the Gentiles. Only God can do this. Only God can show up in one moment and turn a life around. Only God. center point where Paul goes from here is not a string of here read this passage see this text you guys are wrong I'm right he just starts sharing his personal story verse 13 for you have heard of my former life in Judaism how I persecuted the church of God violently and I tried to destroy it he argues that this divine gospel came for an amazing change, an amazing encounter with Jesus on his life. And now he starts to preach it. His story is his best argument. His transformed life is his best argument. That's where he's going. It's the most compelling case he can make for the truth of the gospel. This is what I love about it. We have scripture, and I love scripture, and we're to live from scripture, but our lives are to be marked by what? Scripture. So the truth of the gospel should what? Play out in our life. The truth of scripture should come forth in our life. People should encounter a Christian and go, there's just something different about that individual just by the way they do life. They should be able. And you go, oh, Howie, let's not judge. Here's what I'm saying. We never judge hearts, 
but we got to judge fruit all the time. What are you meaning by fruit? If someone is declaring they've been changed by Jesus and they're not living for Jesus, might I just say, shouldn't there be fruit? Oh, Howie, but I have a tree. My, my tree just doesn't grow fruit. And I go, what fruit tree doesn't produce fruit? If Jesus has changed you, I don't care. There should be at least a baby banana, a baby orange, a baby apple. It should be there. The blossom should be there. There is not, I'm a Christian, but I don't live for Jesus, and I have no fruit to show. No, if I say, church, I follow Jesus, and I've fallen Jesus now by his grace for 31 years, you have all the permission in the world through Scripture to examine my life. Not my heart, my life. And you got to say, well, how is declaring Jesus? Does he really know Jesus? Well, let's examine. That's not judging. That's examining. Judging is this. Oh, Howie doesn't really know Jesus at all. He's not a Christian. No, that's for God. He knows the hearts of man. All right? So coming in here today, maybe you're not familiar with church, and your view of the church is, oh, all they do is judge. That's all they do. No. It's not all we do. And if we judge, the heart of it is that we're not judging to condemn. It's examining Okay, if you confess Jesus, your life should be showing that. That's the point. That's the point. The gospel changes your life. You're transformed so much so that you get to say what Paul says, my former life. If Jesus has changed you, you have this thing called what? A former life. It's there. You can't hide it. You can't dig a hole and bury it in. Like, I've seen Christians try to scurry all the time over this. Oh, yeah? Well, if you know Jesus, I remember what you did back in the 80s. And you go, oh, no, I didn't do that. Oh, yeah, you did do that. Yeah. But but you, you go, yes, I did that. I did it. I was living for me. It was all about me. But guess what? Jesus changed me. Don't be afraid of your story. Some of you, you are so shamed and guilt-ridden over your past when Jesus has redeemed your past. When people need to know, hey, you were really a hot mess. You were. I remember you. I remember you at JR's in Charlottetown. (laughs) Where that sinful country music played and where people danced. I remember you. And you get to go, yeah, I was there. I was grooving to Boodin' Scootin' Boogie, whatever you want to call it. I was there. That was me. But guess what? Now Jesus changed me, and I danced to I am free. I'm free to run. I'm free to sing. I'm free to shout. Jesus is amazing. Yeah, you're right. That was me. That was my former life. Many of you, all of us who know Jesus, We have a former life. Don't try to hide it. Don't glorify it. But let people know Jesus rescued me from my former life. That's what people need to know. So the power that is present in God's gospel in Christ is the power to transform our current life, if you don't know Jesus, into a former life life it holds the power to make this happen regardless how you came in today regardless of how you walked in here today the offer on the table is this in god's gospel you don't have to leave today like you came in you don't have to leave with guilt you don't have to leave with shame you don't have to leave with i feel unworthy I feel not loved. Instead, you can come in today, hear about God's gospel that changes you forever, and you can walk out what we say at Center Point. You can come freely and leave changed. You can encounter Jesus today in a fresh way and walk out of this place, this cafeteria today, and go, I know I encountered Jesus Christ in a very fresh, real way. My life is changed forever. You can You can do that. It can happen. 
center point. It's no different for you and I. In the end, we are our best argument if Jesus has changed us. Just like Paul, we're our best argument. It's one of our best cases. Nothing argues more forcefully for the reality of the gospel than what Jesus does in our life. So when my two Mormon buddies show up at my door and say, hey, Howie, I want to tell you about Mormonism, I go, okay, you tell me about more Mormonism, but I, you need to have my, give me your ear. I want to tell you about the real Jesus of the Bible. I get to look at them, and I get to declare, here's the thing, guys, Jesus is God. Even though you don't believe he is, he is. But at the end of it, I get to go this, go like this. See, me and Jesus have a personal relationship. In fact, last week I was praying and I was asking Jesus if he would show up and do this. And guess what? He did that. That's personal. He hears my prayers. He answers my prayers. He is a real intimate savior. Me and him, we walk together. You guys need that. You need Jesus. Not a form of religion. You need an intimate encounter relationship with Jesus. Christ. So we're not on the same team because of our theology. But Jesus still loves you. Jesus wants to change your heart just like he changed my heart. So we are not afraid of different gospels, but we know that our story and what Jesus does in our life is the best defense we have. So church, our life is changed by the gospel. It's our best argument. Second thing, Paul he was breathing threats and murder. Right now, I want you to think of someone in your life who you would go, humanly, that would be impossible if they came to Jesus. Because all of us have them. It could be a father. It could be a mother. It could be an enemy. It could be a son. It could be a daughter. And you in your mind have gone, that's impossible. Might I just point you to yourself? How many people have labeled you impossible? For some of you, many people have. They have no hope. Oh, look at them. Look at them. They can't make anything happen. And here's the thing. They can't. But Jesus can. See, Paul is a candidate before he became a Christian, where the church would go, Paul, Saul, becoming a Christian, forget it. Impossible. Do you know why? Two factors. Number one, he's a devout Jew. He is driven by Judaism, following the laws, following the rules. The second reason why he would be put into that category is he's a persecutor of what? The Christian faith. So here's what Paul says, verse 14, And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my father. Here's what Paul's saying. If you're having Bible trivia night, pick me. I'm number one. You want to win? I'm the guy. I'm above my peers. I'm advancing in religion beyond anybody else. And we would go, impossible. See, there's some people who are caught up in what we will call not true Christianity. But they're good people. They're living life. They're doing some good things. And, and trust me, there's times where we go, man, it's going to be impossible for them to come to know Jesus. And it's not. It's not. Here's what Paul looked like before Jesus showed up. Acts chapter 8, verse 3. But Saul was ravaging the church. He was entering house after house. He dragged off men and women, and he committed them to prison. That's Paul. That's Saul before Jesus. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Paul was obviously going to be a hard nut to crack. He was. It's obvious. He's an excellent Pharisee. They don't make for easy converts, just like an excellent athlete or an excellent businessman or an excellent mother. They don't make for 
easy converts. You know why? There's a lot of pride built up in what they do, in what they accomplish. And if you go to the root of it, this was Paul's fundamental problem. It was pride. In what? Himself. In his effort. In his doing. So we read in Philippians 3, 4, and 4 to 6. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Here's what Paul just said. If you think that you have it together and you have, you have all the confidence in the world in what you're doing, I have more. And he goes on, circumcised on the eighth day to the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, I was a Pharisee. As for zeal, as for passion, I was persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless, that's Paul. That's who I was. And Paul calls his pride confidence in what? The flesh. Confidence in the flesh. That is what blinds men and women in their need for Jesus. It's the number one thing that stands in the way is that they have pride not in something or, or someone, but, but basically just in themselves. It's pride. That's too simple. Jesus dying on a cross, dying for my sin. Pfft, simple. So they go on the track to earn it. For others, it's, oh, that's great, that's amazing, but I'm going to acknowledge it, but my pride is going to actually live for myself. Paul says, I had confidence in the flesh. So when we put our confidence in our own background, in our status, in our achievements, we will find it very difficult to come to Jesus. Not only is Saul violent, hostile, but on top of that, he has this motivation for his violence as religious discipline. Do you know why he's persecuting Christians? Because he's such an amazing Pharisee. He's such an amazing religious leader. He's so zealous for that. In fact, as we read, and follow me here, because you need to see, this exposes the hypocrisy of external-based religion. Just so you know, living your life following rules and religion and thinking you're great because of that, this exposes a lot of your hypocrisy. Verse 14. There's a line in there. If I could say it this way, hashtag traditions of our fathers. And some of you are like, what's hashtag? All right? Do you know what traditions of our fathers stands for? The Mosaic Law. Here's what Paul is getting at. I was so zealous for the law of Moses that I actually violated the law of Moses. And this is true of people who are self-righteous all the time. It's so true. See, Paul is what? Murdering people. But the law of Moses declares what? Don't murder. And I'm going, excuse me, Paul. Don't you see that? And, and Paul does. He he sees it now that he knows Christ. He's like, I was so zealous for the law that I was actually what? Breaking the law. So if you've been around self-righteous people, and all of us have, here's the kind of personality trait, I'll say, in them all. They're hyper aware of your shortcomings and your failures. And they are not shy to point it out. That's self-righteous people. They watch you. They see how you're doing. And when you fall short, they go, really? Smoking again? 
I conquered smoking back in 1988 just like that. And you can't? Really? Really? Drinking again? Look at me. I stopped drinking. You can. No. Jesus empowers you if you know him in everything. Self-righteous people exalt themselves and they start promoting them. And here's the problem with them. They don't see their own shortcomings. But here's the thing. In their world, people know their shortcomings. And when it's pointed out, they go, oh, you're just not as holy as me. You're just justifying your behavior. You're justifying why you do by pointing out the little speck in my eye. But man, you have a two by four. That's self-righteous people. They have what we call a personality disorder. They're self-righteous, but yet they're still sinful like all of us. And Paul goes, that was me. I was self-righteous. The thing I want you to consider today is this. Even if you're self-righteous, Jesus is calling you to the table to lay down your effort, your good works, and to rely on what he's done for you at the cross and the empty tomb. He's saying, stop your working. Stop thinking you have it all together because the truth of the matter is you don't. Surrender. Lay it down. And Paul is literally in his testimony saying, this was my former life. I was self-righteous. I lived for the law. Among the Pharisees, I was one of the best. That was me before Jesus. Maybe you came in and you're like our poster boy, Paul. You're self-righteous. You go, I'm a good person, Howie. You, you don't really know me. I'm good. I, I know what scripture says about my own heart. There's no good within me. So there's no good in us except Christ who changes us and he gives us that goodness. Oh, man. Here we go. You ready, Chris? Time to land the plane. Okay, here's where I'm going to go. It was a joy for Jesus to show up to Paul. Do you know, it says in our passage, that God found pleasure in revealing himself to Saul. There was pleasure. Now, I've been married, it'll be 10 years in the next month to my beautiful wife. And, and here's the thing. Last month I was in the mall. I had some extra cash. And, and I thought, you know what? It'd be pure joy for me to buy my wife a purse. Now, as a guy walking through the mall, I walk into the stores and I'm in the ladies' areas and I'm looking at purses. And every one who worked there who's a lady is like, you need help. And I went, yeah, I probably do. But here's the thing. I've been with my wife enough. And she's pointed out what she likes. And as a guy, I'm not stupid. I register that. I said, it's in here. You can leave. I know what my wife's looking for. It's all good. And I went and I picked out a purse. And I was traveling home. And as I was traveling home in my truck, there was just joy within my heart. Because I knew when I walk in, I'm carrying this purse, man. And I don't care if people see me carrying a purse because this is for my wife. And when I hand it to my wife, I know this. That's going to be joy for her. But get this. Joy for me. Plus, if you're married, that's called points. It's awesome. And I give my wife this purse, and I'm just so thrilled. I'm so excited because she loves it. And I'm like, score. But Jesus shows up in someone's life, and he's like, this is awesome. This is pure joy. It's so amazing, in fact, that the angels are going to throw a party. 
Wow! Church! Jesus shows up and he gets giddy! Like, this is pure pleasure. And here's the thing, Paul, verse 15. I, get this, I chose you. Before when? Before the foundations of the Lord. While you were in your mom's belly, I knew what you were going to do. Paul, I knew you were going to kill Christians. Paul, I knew you were going to be self-righteous. But Paul, I also knew that I would encounter you by my son Jesus and your life would be changed forever. So Paul, don't be ashamed about what you did in the past, but use that to promote the glory of Jesus. This is who you were. This is who you are now, Paul. Promote that. Share that. That's the gospel. Out of darkness into light. Out of shame wash clean no guilt church you need to hear this and jesus is inviting people all the time to the table here's what i love some of you you think you're here because mom brought you to church she dragged you here some of you think i think this is going to be one of the six sundays i come to church today and here you think you're super sneaky can I just tell you that God is sovereign? That today, May 17th, 2015, God knew you would be in this place. And some of you go, but Howie, according to verse 15, what if I'm not called? What if God hasn't drawn me to salvation? Could I just point out the reality, the truth? Where are you today? You're where? In a church. Not only in a church, but you're in a church that is declaring Jesus is my only hope. Jesus is my only way. Couldn't it be more obvious? I woke up today. I got a lot of things to do. Do you? I'm moving Wednesday. Boxes to be packed. Right? We have a vow renewal coming up. Another wedding to be planned. Planning the first one was big enough. I have things to do, but here's the good news of the gospel. God knows that. He brought you in here today because God, through Jesus, is sitting at the table. And here's what I love. You came in here today, and you have a plate. See, and on this plate is a whole lot of mess. Anger, lying, pride, laziness, gluttony. Is gluttony a sin? Yeah. Greed, self-righteousness, envy, sexual sin, faithless. You're giving up where God has called you to be faithful, faithless. You are a gossip. You are a slanderer. You come to the table. And some of you, you think, oh, I'm good. I got it together. Trust me. This is all our plate. And we sit at the table with Jesus. Now, Jesus has a plate. His plate is hope, new life, eternal life, accepted, promises, the Holy Spirit, peace, relationship, joy, purpose, identity. And some of you, you come in with your plate and you're going, life is so amazing. Life's so great. It's like eating cardboard pizza. But you're going, wow, wow. And Jesus is saying, hey, hey, you want my plate? You want my plate? See, in a moment, Jesus can turn your life around. So here's what he does. He takes your plate and he goes, thank you. I already paid for that. It's called the cross. I knew no sin, and I became your anger. I became your lying. I became your lust. I became your stealing. I went to the cross, and I became that for you. Hello, do you want my plate? And here's what Jesus does. 
he, he, he encounters us just like he did Paul, and he could do this for you today, right now. You don't even have to say a prayer. Like, you could be sitting here right now and going, I want your plate, Jesus. I want your plate. Give me your plate. And you get his plate, and you're like, wow, I have hope. I have purpose. I, I have new life. I'm reconciled. I'm accepted. I'm forgiven. I'm home. I'm home. This is where I'm meant to be. And, and that doesn't lead you to go, oh, thanks, Jesus. Can I have my plate now? And I got these two plates. And I'm like, I'm going to live for my anger. I'm going to live for my greed. I'm going to live for my sexual sin. No, you give your plate to Jesus, and you're like, I'm all about holiness. I'm all about your joy, Jesus. I'm all about serving you for your purpose. Oh, Jesus, thank you for your plate. Some of you, you need that plate, no matter if you're self-righteous, no matter if you think you're good, no matter if you came in here a hot mess, you need this plate. And when you get this plate, here's what happens forever. You now live from that identity. Because of what Jesus has done, this is who I am. This is why I love saying, my name is St. Howie. It is. Biblically, read Hebrews, I'm a saint. Now, people in Kings County know Howie. And they go, he's not a saint. And I go, you got that right. In my own efforts, in my own working, I am not a saint. But because Jesus has changed me, saved me, I am a saint. I follow Jesus. I live for Jesus. He's my pure joy. He's my hope. He's my meaning. He's the reason I got out of bed today to come here. It's Jesus, church. Always been Jesus. And Paul is saying, I'm not preaching a false gospel. Nobody, nobody taught me this. Nobody gave me this except Jesus. So the true gospel will always fly in the face of our selfishness, of our working, of us thinking, I got it together. No, you don't. And Jesus has the plate, and he's saying today. In fact, how did Paul come to know Jesus? A moment. Here's what I love. Some of you go, they're hopeless. They're living life inside out, backwards. They don't have a clue. But can I tell you this? Today, if Jesus wanted to, in his grace, encounter them, he would change them forever. Right now. And some of you, he wants to change you right now. And here's what I love. It's this. It's confession. It's Romans 10. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, and we believe in our hearts that God raised us from the dead, from Jesus from the dead, what happens? We will be saved brought from darkness into marvelous light. And if you've been brought from darkness, you don't go, oh, I miss the darkness. No, you're in marvelous light and you're like, this is amazing. I want nothing more than this. Jesus and only Jesus. He's enough, church. And here's what he gives you. Freedom. Freedom. I don't have to carry the weight of my past sin. I don't have to carry the, the weight of my family brokenness. I don't have to carry the weight of my mess. I can hand that all over to Jesus, church. What an amazing Savior. We're going to sing a song. I'm going to pray. But man, my heart is really saying, don't believe the lie that you got it all together outside of Jesus. I want you to sing this song, I'm set free, like free people. And how do you do that? It's only through Christ. I don't have a pill, I can't give you that. It's only through Christ. Here's my failures. Here's my weaknesses. Here's my successes. Here's my joys. But Jesus, take them. Take them. I want you, you, are the one who gives me freedom. You are the one who sets my life on a path that just leads to godliness and righteousness. Jesus, I want you. Heavenly Father, I just praise you and thank you that you've given us the hope 
through your son, Jesus. God, I even thank you today as a messenger, as I've studied all week, and I didn't get to a lot of things, but I thank you that I got to Jesus. God, right now, I truly believe that in a moment, you want to turn lives around. I pray as we sing this song, through the power of your spirit, you will set people free from themselves. God, I pray that today will be the day of salvation like you declare in your word. I pray for the Christian who's acknowledged you with their lips, but their hearts are far from you. Call them back to the cross. Let them rise up and sing, I'm set free. It is for freedom, it is for freedom that I've been set free. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you.